Okay, so so the next thing that we have here is example number 22. It has two parts. So example number 22, part 1. Part 1 is basically, let's say that f of x is equal to is equal to x raised to the power 5 minus cos x over sin x. And so you can um, you can use the quotient rule, of course, meaning that you can write f prime of x is equal to the quotient rule is u by v whole prime is equal to u prime times v minus u v prime over v v squared so you can write this as u prime times v which is x raised to the power 5 minus cos x whole prime times sin x minus basically u which is x raised to the power 5 minus cos x times v times v prime which is equal to sin x whole prime and then divide that by sine squared x and then divide that by sine squared x and so you know that d by dx of x raised to power 5 minus sine x if you if you if you do that individually you get d, d by dx of x raised to power 5 minus cos x is equal to basically d by dx of x raised to the power 5 minus d by dx of cos x that is basically x raised to power n which is n times x raised to power n minus 1 so that gives you 5 times x raised to the power 4 and d by dx of cos x is equal to negative sine x negative into negative is positive plus sine x so d by dx of x raised to the power 5 minus sine minus cos x is equal to is equal to basically 5 x raised to the power 4 um, plus sine x times sine x minus x raised to the power 5 minus cos x times sine x whole, basically whole prime the derivative of sine x is cos x divided by sine squared x and so you have and let me see how they have solved this problem I think if we can basically do this calculation we will get basically uh, 5 times x raised to the power 4 times sine x plus sine squared x minus uh, so that is x raised to the negative x raised to the power 5 times cos x and negative into negative is positive so plus cos squared x over sine squared x sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to 1 so you have uh, basically 5 5 times x raised to the power 4 times sine x minus x raised to the power 5 times cos x plus 1 over sine squared x and uh, that is uh, basically 5x raised to the power 4 times sine x minus x raised to the power 5 times cos x plus 1 over sine squared x. So this is number, this was part 1 of this question. Part 2 is the, the function that you have is, let's say that this is part 2. Let's say that the function that you have is f of x is equal to x plus cos x x plus cos x over tan x over tan x and so what you have is basically you can use the quotient rule again meaning that you can say that basically u divided by v whole prime is equal to 
u prime times v minus u v prime over v squared. Um, so f prime of x is going to be equal to basically x plus cos x, x plus cos x whole prime times basically v which is equal to tan x minus x plus cos x times times basically v prime which is tan x whole prime and divide that by tan squared x so the derivative of x plus cos x is 1 plus 1 minus sin x that's 1 minus sin x times tan x minus x plus cos x times the derivative of tan x is secant squared x is secant squared x and divide that by tan squared x and then you can you can you can probably They have written it at, at, at basically in this form, 1 minus sine x times sine x minus cos plus x plus cos x times secant squared x over tan squared x, and that is the answer here. So that is basically um, um, the, the, the rest of the, the, rest of the, the miscellaneous examples on this chapter. Uh, what we can do is, uh, what we can do is, uh, now continue with the miscellaneous exercises in the, under, for, for this chapter, which is, there is 30 of them, and then we can move to the class 12 uh, book that we have, uh, and, and, and do the rest of calculus. Basically. Okay, so the next question that we basically, the miscellaneous exercises on this chapter, we have... We want to find the derivative of the following functions from the first principle. So, for example, number one, part one, we want to find the derivative of f of x is equal to negative x from the first principle. Of course, you know that this is a line of, of, of slope negative one, meaning that the line would be this line over here. And since it's a straight line there with the slope negative one, the slope of the line is the same at any point all across the line. And therefore the derivative of the line becomes negative once equal to the, to the, to the, to the, to the slope of the line. But from the first principle, you can say that basically f prime of x is equal to the limit of basically the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x as over h as h tends to zero which is the same thing as the limit of f of x plus h which is negative of x plus h minus f of x which is minus negative x over h as h tends to zero And uh, <clears throat> so this is equal to the limit of uh, basically negative x negative h plus x over h as h tends to zero. And there you have basically x and negative x you can cancel out, h and h you can cancel out. So you have the limit of the limit of uh, basically negative one as h tends to 0 and the limit of negative 1 as h tends to zero. okay so the limit of negative 1 as h tends to 0 I did make a mistake I wrote that as 0 which is of course not I mean it doesn't really make sense in any sense to 
to get the answer zero because the this line actually does have a slope and then the limit of negative one as x as x tends to zero is basically the limit of this function this is f of x is equal to is equal to negative one right and so you can see that the limit that the value of this function everywhere is negative one it's a constant function and therefore uh, the limit of negative one and it doesn't matter what number h tends to everywhere is equal to negative one the value of the function is equal to negative one and therefore you can say that the limit of negative one as h tends to zero is equal to negative one which is the derivative of f of x is equal to negative x therefore d by dx of f of x which is equal to d by dx of basically negative x is equal to negative 1 which is the slope of the line <coughs> the slope of the line everywhere everywhere across the line and when I say everywhere across the line that means that the that the slope of the line does not change all throughout the line from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. The slope is constant. You know, the slope is constant. Meaning that meaning that the meaning that if this was the the position function of a car moving along a straight road, then this then the velocity of that car would be a constant velocity meaning that meaning that acceleration would be zero when acceleration is zero your velocity is constant meaning that your velocity is not changing but when there is acceleration that means that your velocity is changing at at, at some rate right so and this gives you an idea of the, the the relationship between position velocity and acceleration meaning that position we, we saw that basically we had the position function of a function of a, of a car moving along a straight road. We differentiated that function and the derivative of that function was the velocity function of the same car. Then what that means is that since now acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, then it, then, then what that means is that if you differentiate the, 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 basically the velocity function of the of the of the same car you will get the acceleration function of the same car moving along the same road and then once we get into integrals you can go the other way around meaning that if you have the acceleration function of a car moving along a straight road when you when you, when you integrate the, the the acceleration function it will give you the velocity function integrate the velocity function it will give you the position function and that's just how it is meaning that <coughs> meaning that the, the the derivative of a function whatever that might be shows the rate of change of the variable across the the across the, the, the vertical axis with respect to the variable across the horizontal axis so for example when when in the case of the position function of a car the vertical axis is the is the the position function the vertical axis becomes the position of the car the vertical the horizontal axis becomes time right now if you want to 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 consider to, to study the rate of change of position with respect to time you take the derivative of this function and as a result of course by definition you will get the velocity function Again, when you have the velocity of the function along the vertical axis uh, with respect to the to time along the horizontal axis, if you want to study the the rate of change of velocity with respect to time, you take the derivative of the velocity function, and that in turn will give you the uh, acceleration function of the car. So it's it's basically. Uh, that simple and that powerful of course okay so 
so far we have covered so much ground and uh, so let's just keep moving in this in, in, in these exercises okay so the next question is basically question number one part two which is basically the let's say that f of x is equal to negative x raised to the power negative one and that is that is your function right so you can use uh, basically uh, you can do this in two different ways meaning that you can write f of x as as basically negative one over negative one over x and then use the quotient rule u by v u by v is whole prime is equal to u prime times v u prime times v minus u v prime divided by v squared you can you can do this or you can use the you can use basically uh, d by dx of x raised to the power n is equal to n times x raised to the power n minus 1 and so we will we will use this one so you would you would get basically um, you would you would using this 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 form of the function you would get f prime of x is equal to negative one times times negative x raised to the power raised to the power uh, basically negative two which is the same thing as uh, negative one over negative x raised to the second power um, actually this is not right so you would write this as you would write this as negative one negative one times negative one times times negative x is equal to x and then that would become x raised to the power negative 2 so that would be uh, 1 over 1 over x raised to the power 2 or in other words you can say that you can say that you have negative 1 times times negative x raised to the power negative 2 right and then that would be that, that would be positive x raised to the power negative 2 which is equal to 1 over x squared right so you can use this 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 one and you need to be careful about these signs here you can do this or you can use the the, the quotient rule meaning that you can write f of x as again as negative one over x and then f prime of x would be equal to uh, basically based on here you would write it as basically u prime which is negative one raised to this uh, negative one whole, whole prime times x minus u which is equal to negative one times basically v prime v prime is 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 x prime and divided by x squared right and so you will get basically the derivative of negative one is equal to zero so this whole thing becomes zero negative into negative is positive the the derivative of x is equal to one so that's one over x squared the same thing that we got over here now this next thing that we have is basically the the part three of this question is f of x is equal to sine of x plus one which is equal to which is basically your function um, so uh, okay so now to basically to derive the derivative of this of this function based on the first principle 
you know that basically f prime of x is equal to the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h as h tends to 0, right? Now f of x plus h in this function becomes f of x plus h, which is equal to, in this function, becomes sine of, instead of x, you write x plus h, so x plus h plus 1. And therefore, here you can write the limit of sine of x plus h plus 1 minus sine of x plus 1 divided by h as h tends to 0. Now, here I have sine x minus sine y, and you know that sine x, you know that sine x minus sine y, sine y is equal to, uh, sine x minus sine y is equal to 2 times cos x plus y divided by 2 times sine of x minus y divided by 2 which means that basically I could write this x plus y divided by 2 would be x plus y divided by 2 would be in this case for example x plus h plus 1 plus this angle plus x plus 1 divided by 2 which is equal to 2x plus plus h plus 2 2x plus h plus 2 2x plus h plus 2 divided by 2 and x minus y x minus y divided by 2 is equal to this angle minus this angle, which is x plus h plus 1 minus x minus 1 divided by 2. These two will be cancelled out, these two will be cancelled out. You will be left with h divided by 2. h divided by 2. So you have now basically the limit of the limit of basically so two times two times cos of two times cos of x plus y divided by two which is two x plus h plus two divided by two times basically sine of x minus y divided by two which is equal to h divided by two right and divide that by h as h tends to zero now here I have sine of h divided by 2 and you know that basically the limit of sine x by x as x tends to 0 is equal to 1. So having this in mind we can write this as the limit of sine of h divided by 2 divide that by h divided by 2 now, if you divide the denominator by 2, that means that you have multiplied the whole fraction by a factor of 2, meaning that you have a, you have a fraction a by b. Den divide the denominator, for example, by some factor c. That's the same thing as a times the reciprocal of this, which is c divided by b, which is a divided by b times c. a divided by b was my my Muslim original fraction and now you can see that I have multiplied the, the fraction by C meaning that when you take a fraction A divided by B and divide the denominator by C that means that you've multiplied the whole fraction by C so of course when you multiply your fraction by C you have to divide the fraction by C as well so that you haven't changed the value of the fraction now if I divide this fraction by by now I have basically since I have added this 2 in the denominator that means that I have uh, basically multiplied this whole fraction or 
assuming that I'm that assuming that I write this over here as well that 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 I have multiplied the whole fraction by a factor of two. So then I divide by two as well, so that uh, the, the 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 effect is cancelled out. So I write this as basically previously I had over here times two cos of two x plus h plus two divided by two and um, and so to 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 ca to cancel out the effect of this two i divide the denominator i divide the denominator by two so i'm taking the limit of this whole thing as x tend as h tends to zero and therefore i will be able to write this as the limit of basically sine of h divided by 2 divided by h divided by 2 as h as h divided by 2 tends to 0 and i'm saying h divided by 2 tends to 0 because well originally h tends to 0 but if if h tends to 0 h divided by 2 also tends to 0 so we can write that and times the limit of basically this these two twos cancel out cos of 2x plus h plus 2 divided by 2 as as basically as um, h tends to 0 now this is equal to 1 because the limit of sine of x by x as x tends to 0 is equal to 1 and as h tends to zero, this becomes zero. So you have, uh, so you have basically um, two x plus two divided by two, which is equal to x plus one, x plus one. So two x plus two divided by two is equal to two times x plus one divided by two. Cancel these two out. You get x plus one. So this becomes cos of x plus 1 right so that means that basically the limit of the, the derivative of sine of x plus 1 that means that d by dx of sine of x plus 1 is actually equal to cos of x plus 1 cos of x plus 1 and of course you know that you know that basically the the and you know that d by dx of sine x originally is equal to cos x and i think that of course i haven't proved this but i think that whatever you have as the argument of the sine function becomes the argument of the cos function here meaning that if you write for example d by dx of sine of for example i don't know um, for example, 2x, that becomes cos of 2x. I think it is that way, but then you have to do your own, um, I mean, prove it for yourself, or or at least prove it as a theorem for yourself, if you, if you need it anywhere in your work. Otherwise, right now, I'm just doing, I'm just going through these exercises, and, um, and, uh, um get myself as much uh, as much knowledge possible from from this text as much as as, as 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 much knowledge as possible from this text as I can um, the, 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 it depends on what you want to do there are certain things that you might need in your work you have to um, make sure that your mathematics is correct and you might um, find it interesting to note that to 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 note that Einstein the first time that he was talking about the that he, that he was talking about the special uh, theory of relativity his mathematics was actually wrong so <laughs> and but of course they never actually got to test his theory because of there, there was a war back then going on, and their equipment was were confiscated by the, the government of Russia and other governments, and so on and so forth. But it, it as it turns out, his mathematics was wrong, and somebody checked his work later, 
once they were not successful in uh, checking in, in in actually testing the theory practically and then they actually had to change the theory a little bit as far as at least the mathematics was concerned as far as i know so you need to make sure that mathematically you're correct okay okay so the next part of this question is part four which is basically you want to find you want to find the derivative of f of x is equal to cos of x minus pi by h x minus pi by h so um, so of course you are using the first principle so you know that basic df prime of x is equal to the limit of basic df of x plus h minus f of x divided by h as h tends to zero and f of x plus h would be would be basic d would be the cos of x plus h minus pi by h and therefore you can write this as the limit of f of x plus h which is equal to cos of x plus h minus pi by h minus f of x which is equal to the cos of x minus pi by h divide that by h as h tends to zero now here you have cos x minus cos y and cos x minus cos y is equal to um, you know that cos x minus cos y is equal to negative two times sine of x plus y divided by 2 sine of x plus y divided by 2 sine of x minus y divided by 2 and and so basically over here x plus y divided by 2 would be would be would be basically would correspond to this angle plus this angle divided by two so you have x plus h minus pi by h plus x minus pi by h divided by two and that is the same thing as two x plus h now negative pi by eight negative pi by eight is negative two times pi by eight which is negative pi by four negative pi by four and divide that by two and x minus y divided by two x minus y divided by two <coughs> is equal to this angle minus this angle divide by two so x plus h minus pi by eight um, minus basically this angle which is negative x plus pi by eight plus pi by eight and divide that by two pi by eight and pi by eight you can cancel out x and x you can cancel out you get h divided by two so then you can write this as basically the limit of The limit of negative two times negative two times sine of x plus y divided by two, which becomes two x plus h minus pi by four divided by two times sine of x minus y divided by, which is sine of basically h divided by two, and you take the the limit of that as h tends to zero so 
Now what you can do is that you can write this as uh, and of course you have h over here as well. This is whole divided by divided by h. Now uh, what you can do is that you can write the limit of you can write the limit you can write it as the limit of basically sine h divided by 2 divided by h divided by 2 so I'm dividing by 2 here and as we discussed in the previous example when you divide the denominator by 2 you're multiplying the whole fraction by a factor of 2 and therefore you have to divide the whole fraction by 2 so that the 2's are cancelled out when you divide this fraction by 2 this 2 will be cancelled out and therefore you can just simply say that for example this 2 for example you take it to the denominator to the you you, you divide the denominator by this 2 you can you can basically you can say that as well for example but of course what happens is that um, when you divide the denominator by 2 you have multiplied the whole fraction by 2 and then since you have to divide the fraction again by 2 to cancel out the effect of that of that 2 that, that, that you use in the denominator then this 2 and that 2 will cancel out and then you can say that for example you can take this 2 to the denominator below h for example something like that you can we can think of that that way as well. Many people do these kinds of tricks, but um, uh, but uh, you need to know essentially why that works. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter why. I mean, if you want to to, to do it, you have to know what why the trick works. And so then you have um, and then you have a negative sign over here. You have a negative sign over here you can you can write the negative sign for example outside of the limit and then over here you can write basically the sign of the sign of 2x plus h minus pi by 4 divide divide that by 2 and take the limit of that as h tends to 0 as h tends to 0 now you can write this as the as negative limit of as negative limit of sine of h divided by 2 divided by h divided by 2 as h divided by 2 tends to 0 because when h tends to 0 h divided by 2 tends, tends to 0 times the limit of sine 2x plus h minus pi by 4 divide that by 2 as as basically as h tends to zero and this becomes a negative one this becomes a one times negative times negative one is negative one and this becomes a uh, basically this as h tends to zero this becomes 2x plus 2x minus pi by 4 divided by 2 which is the same thing as x minus pi by 8 x minus pi by 8 so you have the negative of basically um, a negative of sine x minus pi by 8 and as you can see this generally works meaning that for example here I have the limit of for example here I have the derivative of cos of x minus pi by 8 cos of x minus pi by 8 so d by dx of cos of x minus pi by 8 and that is equal to that is equal to negative sign uh, basically x minus pi by 8 right so that is that that works that way and you know that basically d by dx of cos x is is generally equal to a negative sign x so it seems that these the argument of the of the cos function of the sine function or whatever you use in the in the derivative you can just simply write it as it is and then and then use the 
the the the derivative of the trigonometric functions themselves as as you know them meaning that you know that d by dx of d by dx of sine x is equal to cos x you know that d by dx of cos x is equal to negative sine x you know that d by dx of uh, basically tan x is equal to is equal to I think secant squared x secant squared x and you know that the d by dx of cot x d by dx of cot x is equal to negative cosecant squared x and you know that d by dx of d by dx of secant x is equal to secant x tan x And you know that the d by dx of cosecant x is equal to negative cosecant x cot x. So if you know this much, if you know these, basically these derivatives, then whatever x is here, you can you can you can substitute it with the x over here. For example, if x is 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 for example x minus pi by eight here, you write x minus pi by eight. If if x is is is, is any function, you can put the essentially the same function over here. But of course, I do not really know the 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 any basically exceptions or anything that might exist there so you might want to uh, basically um, prove whatever whatever it is that you want to do prove it for yourself and then use it otherwise i'm not really i have never actually proved this before myself i'm not but i've seen generally that it works almost everywhere i mean all of the examples that i've seen so far in all of the, the examples it works but of course that's no mathematical proof and so you know what you need to do in these cases so that is basically that now this was question number um, one it had four parts so we, we went through all the four parts um, and in the next questions, we want to find the derivative of these functions, of the following functions, and uh, it is to be understood. It is to be understood that a, b, c, d, p, q, r, and s are fixed non-zero constants, and m and n are integers. So, so it is to be understood that a in all of the examples that we discussed in all of these exercises all the way up to number 30 that uh, a b c d a b c d p q r p q r and s are not are fixed non-zero constants fixed non-zero constants fixed non-zero constants and m and n are integers m and n are integers that means that well they can they can uh, they can uh, first of all they are integers and second of all that means that they, they can take the value of zero as well and of course they can be negative positive but only integers, meaning that negative 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, also 0. But then a non-zero constant would be, of course, non-zero. But then it doesn't have to be an integer. It could be, for example, 2.1 as well. It could be negative 3.6 as well, and so on and so forth. So let's see how we can deal with that problem. <coughs> So the first one that we have, the first question that we have here is number 84. I'm sorry, number two, question number two that we will discuss in just a few moments. Okay, so now 
The next questions are, let's start from question number two. And let's see what we have here. Okay, it seems that you're supposed to solve these, at least in the case of this problem, using the first principle. So number two, f of x is equal to x plus a. And so then the f prime of x would be equal to the limit of basically f of x plus h minus f of x as over h as h tends to zero. And so uh, f of x plus h, f of x plus h would be equal to basically x plus h plus a, right? x plus h plus a, which means that f prime of x is equal to the limit of x plus h plus a minus f of x, which is negative x negative a over h as h tends to zero as these two you can cancel out. <coughs> Excuse me. And h and h you can cancel out. So you have the limit of one as h tends to zero, which is equal to one. And therefore, and therefore f, f basically d by dx of, um, d by dx of, um, and therefore d by dx of x plus a is equal to, is equal to one, which is actually the, 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 the slope of this, this, this line meaning that the line is some x plus a and x plus a is for example if you take a as for example a is equal to 2 then the, then the line becomes f of x is equal to f of x is equal to x plus 2 then that would be some line that would be basically the line f of f of x is equal to x but then shifted up two units which means that you would get basically a line like this. This is f of x is equal to x plus 2. Now, the, the, basically the fact that you move this line up and down, it doesn't change the slope of the line. And therefore, um, the, the value of the function or the, the slope of the function at any point x doesn't change. And so the, and so the, the, the derivative of the function does not change. Meaning that if you had f of x is equal to x, and if you found the, the derivative of this function, you would find, you would find that d by dx of x is also equal to 1, which is the, the slope of this line over here, the slope of this, this, this red line over here. The slope of this line is 1 because it makes a 45 degree angle with the positive direction of the x-axis. Any uh, point that you take on this line, and if you, and any two points that you take on this line, if you draw a triangle over here, this side of the triangle would be equal to this side of the triangle. And therefore this angle, theta, the tan of this angle would be equal to this side divided by this side, whatever this side is, you have the same length as the, as the length of this side. So that would be some a divided by some a would be equal to z, would be equal to 1. And therefore we say that the slope of the line is 1. And by the same logic, for example, if you had a line like this, of course, the slope of this line is higher than the slope of this line because if I take any two points on this on this line, and if you if I take any two points on this line, and take and draw a triangle, a right angle triangle, this angle theta, the tan of this angle would be this length by this length which is of course a number much higher than one because this this length is at least three times the length of this line so the slope of this line would be three for example right 
And when, when we say that basically the slope of the line, M, which is equal to the slope of the line, the slope of the line is equal to, is equal to tan of theta, that's just a definition. Meaning that, and the definition is based on the fact that, uh, for example, if you had a ramp, if you were to go up this ramp on a wheelchair, for example, going up this, going up this ramp would be much easier to, than going up this ramp, because this ramp is, the slope of this ramp is, is much higher than the slope of this ramp. And then, if you take any two points on this line and construct a right angle triangle here, you would see that basically, uh, of course, the slope of the line is less than one. Um, but then uh, you can see that if you take, for example, if you if you create this triangle here, you would see that the you you would see that you would get much more run. Mm, compared to the height then compared to this case right meaning that here your 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 run would be much more than the height here the run is quite the same as the as the rise basically which means that the in this case for example the 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 slope would be much closer to one than this than this case in this case, basically, the slope of the line is very close to zero because it's a it, it, because it, the, the slope of this line would be rise over run, rise over run, meaning that this length divided by this length, and uh, so this would be, for example, something like zero point two divided by five centimeters. Zero point two divided by five centimeters. This would be, for example, two centimeter divided by five centimeter. Of course, this number would be much, much closer to one than this number. This number would be much closer to, I don't know, just like, for example, it would be a very, very tiny number, of course. Like, for example, 200 times, times, times 5 would be, but it would be much, 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 much smaller number, right? Okay. Now, um, the second question that we have here is Px plus Q. Question number three, we have P, basically, let's call it f of x is equal to Px plus Q times times r over x times r over x plus s so we said that p q r and s are constants and uh, so now here you can use for example the the product rule right so that using the product rule using the Leibniz product rule Leibniz product rule we have the Leibniz product rule is u times v whole prime is equal to u prime times v plus u v prime which is which is in this case, then you you could say that f prime of x is equal to p x plus q whole prime the prod the, the the derivative of this times times this which is r divided by x plus s plus basically the, the first function p x plus q p x plus q times the derivative of this function, times basically r over x plus s plus s whole prime. Now the this function you can write it as this px plus q and then over here you have, I'm sorry, you have to take the derivative of that. So that, that, you, that you, you can take the derivative of this, the derivative of this again is 
it's a straight line it's a straight line with slope p and y intercept q so the y intercept becomes the derivative of the y intercept becomes zero of course and the derivative of the line becomes the slope of the line so that means that the, the, the derivative of this whole thing becomes p times uh, basically r over x plus s and then you can write px plus q px plus q times the derivative of this and the derivative of this this is just a constant the s is a constant so the derivative of that is zero and the derivative of r over x is basically uh, d by dx of r over x so this is a constant this is a this is the variable right now you can write this as d by dx of r times x raised to the power negative one and you know that basically d by dx of x raised to the power n is equal to n times x raised to the power negative n times x raised to the power n minus one so that means that this becomes negative one times r negative one times r times x raised to the power negative two which is equal to negative r divided by r squared right and then this part is zero so that would be negative r divided by divided by divided by actually by x squared i'm sorry by x squared negative r divided by x squared and so um, and so that would be basically the, the derivative of your function now px plus q uh, times negative r into x raised to the power negative 2 plus r over x plus s times p Now they have multiplied everything here into this so, this, so you can write this as PR divided by X plus PS plus turning minus minus PR X minus PR actually you would have you would have basically P you would have negative p r p r x divided by x squared and then you would have x so negative p r by x negative p r by x and then over here you have you have basically negative q r by x squared negative q r by by x squared so pr by x negative pr by x that you can cancel out and so you have you have ps minus qr by x squared that's the that's the answer here <coughs> so that was question number three question number four you have basically ax plus b times cx plus d times cx plus d whole squared and that is equal to and and that let's call this for example f of x now if you want to you can use the you can of course use the product rule You can of course use the product rule here so let me actually make this a little bit bigger 
or let me actually end this video here and then we will continue this in the next video.